So what's been the biggest benefit that you felt from being alcohol free, Raina? I would say, you know, being very present with my children and really showing up for them where they need me, you know, by way of example, um, you know, my oldest is going through college application process now, which is enormously stressful for, you know, high school seniors, especially playing catch up after COVID. And, you know, she has, she needs feedback on her supplemental essays and, and I'm there, I'm there. I'm just, I'm right with her step by step, you know, and Raina, who was drinking would be like, yeah, okay, honey, I'll, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't share her urgency, right? I'm right there with her. Or my 13 year old son who wants to go to a hangout up in Marin County. I live in San Francisco. So that's over the bridge. And none of that happened. Have I had a sip of wine. I would never do that. But now it's like, sure, honey, let's, let's go to Marin, you know? And so the whole, it, it's about him, you know, those Friday nights. And I have those precious conversations, you know, with just, you know, I've got three children. So one-on-one -on -one conversations are really impactful and meaningful. Um, and then my middle daughter is struggling. Um, she struggles with depression and anxiety, James, and one of her maladaptive coping behaviors uh, was smoking weed. And um, so, you know, I dropped her off at rehab for the second time uh, at the end of August and I matriculated in project 90 on September 1. It was just, for me, it was, look, she's doing something really hard and giving up something she thinks she needs. And I voluntarily, you know, gave up something hard that was helping me cope through, you know, my stresses. And um, it's, you know, it's had a, a tremendous impact on her. She didn't think I was going to do it. And now that I have, I think, you know, my stock has gone up. <laughs> <laughs> what did she say to you when you told her that you were going to do Project 90 as a way of, a means of solidarity, I guess, with her? Um, she, she really was blown away. You know, first it was, you know, mom, you don't have to do that. You know, I know how much you enjoy wine. But then I said, you know, but... But Alex, I'm learning about addiction. I'm learning about the science of why we're drawn, for in my case, alcohol, why you're drawn to your substance of choice. And um, you know, information is power. So I want to do this with you. And I think, you know, I think I know it had um a tremendous impact on her. Yeah, it sounds it. Yeah. And what impact did it have on you? Um, that's a great question. So for me, like, I feel really vital and clear and present and mindful and make a distinction between those two things. Um, the other thing is that, um, my skin feels incredible and it, alcohol is so dehydrating and, you know, no amount of water really makes up for all that dehydration. So now that I have it all out of my system, like I'm, you know, feel great. I look younger because my skin looks great. I don't know. I, a lot of great things. And have you received feedback from loved ones or friends or acquaintances about this new upgraded version of Raina? Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, um, you know, some, some of the people in the program, James, have like these amazing transformations. You know, they're losing, you know, 30 pounds. One of people in our cohort lost 30 pounds, which is amazing. Or, you know, they, they're going from a six to a 10, as you like to say. I think for me, I probably went from like a seven to a nine, maybe. Mm. And, um, but it, feel, it feels great. Like my creativity is back. Um, you know what else is really remarkable? Um, I'm able to access joy a lot more readily. You know, alcohol, of course, is a depressant. And I think we all take that for granted. I mean, like we think, oh, you know, let's have drinks and have some fun, right? We associate it with fun, but the reality is it's a depressant. So once it's completely out of your system, like for me anyway, I'm like music makes me joyful or listening to laughter brings me great joy. Um, you know, I don't know, it's, it's, I'm able to access joy a lot more readily.
which is so fabulous. Yeah, that should be like the slogan for it, for any business. I think it's like <laughs> a multi-million dollar slogan, access joy more easily. Like that's so good, isn't it? What What's the kind of joy that you've been able to access or, or what brings you joy that maybe you weren't able to access previously? Yeah, that's a great question. Like, so I don't miss anything now. I mean, I consider myself a pretty perceptive and situationally aware person in general, but, you know, with alcohol numbing me out a little bit, you know, you miss things and I don't miss anything now. (laughs) So, um, you know, scents and sounds and, you know, uh, tactile sensations and snippets of conversations. Um, Like I'm just really hyper aware. And um, I don't know, you would think that that would be too much stimulation, but it's not because it's, um, I don't know, it's grounding. You know, I, I take it all in and I process it and, and what it yields usually is, you know, a positive response, joy, connection, you know, to the people that matter most to me, who matter most to me. And who are those people that matter most to you? Well, mostly my children. Um, and of course I have, I've, dear friends. And I don't know, they've noticed, they've noticed the difference. Um, and the other thing too, is I feel as though, you know, my, my oldest is about to be 18, James. And so she's forming her relationship with alcohol, you know, as a senior in high school. Um, I don't know, you know, there are parties and, you know, we've had many, many conversations about kind of the rules of engagement and the fact that she has an unmyelinated brain that, you know, she's potentially harming with substances. Um, and I told her that, like, I, I wanted to model the kind of behavior that, you know, I'd like her to adopt, you know, so, and she, she's, and she gets it, you know, she's, she's pretty sophisticated. I want to invite you to think back to when you were your daughter's age, let's say, let's say between 16 and 18. Do you recall who your role models were regarding drinking? Or do you recall where your relationship with alcohol, and by that, I mean, the normalization of it, the the smile that people have when they're inviting you to have a drink? Like, do you can you recall when you were your daughter's age, how you formed those lifelong habits of normalizing alcohol? I can. Um, So interestingly, when I was my daughter's age, I was a goody two shoes. And um, my brother was, my younger brother was doing the drinking. And I was the one that was collecting keys to make sure nobody drove. And I was like the, you know, the governor (laughs) and making sure everybody's safe. Um, And my parents weren't big drinkers, James. But when I went to college, it was a whole different universe, right? And I joined a sorority and, you know, huge drinking culture. We were, my sorority was like work hard, play hard. You know, we did a lot of philanthropy, but we also won all the, you know, beer drinking contests. And, um, and, you know, blackout drinking was kind of normal and funny, you know, like not remembering what happened kind of thing. Um, I remember my first experience with grain alcohol. I went to school in the Southeast and grain alcohol was a thing. And, you know, I was tiny and, you know, I blacked out, you know, and, um, and I can remember not anybody being alarmed by that, you know, myself included, you know, that's what we did, you know, you drink and, 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 you know, during this last 90 days, I've been very reflective about just that, like what role has alcohol played in my life and, you know, where it started and its trajectory. Cause it, cause it is a relationship. It's a relationship that you have with alcohol, you know? Um, but yeah, for me, it was college. Um, and do you see, do you see how possibly your normalization of alcohol in your parenting years influenced your children 
and maybe helped them to normalize alcohol? Or do you think that there's so much outside influence that it was more of a societal influence than a mama influence? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. And my children are in a, a special situation because the father of my girls is an alcoholic. Like he, he'll label himself an alcoholic and um, he's in recovery. That's an AA term, that's what he uses. Um, so I'm just going to adopt his nomenclature. Um, and he's, um, you know, he's fallen out of sobriety twice during my girl's lifetime in kind of a very substantial way where lost his job, you know, financial insecurity. Um, so by comparison, you know, I didn't have a problem, you know, and it's interesting Um when I had a conversation with my oldest, interestingly, she wrote about this for her common app essay, James. So, you know, when she's representing herself to the world, you know, of college admissions directors, this is the story she tells about how, you know, her dad um, had problems with sobriety and now her sister does and how that impact did her and her resilience and her ability to um, navigate the world. But when I had a conversation with her about it, she said to me, yeah, mom, you just have a high tolerance. And I was like, oh my God. Like that really, I mean, that was like a cold bucket of water dumped on mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. You know, my very sophisticated, compassionate 18 year old thinks I have a high tolerance. So my drinking isn't a problem. Like, wow. So that was, um, I was already in the program at that point. So it was an enormous validation. Um, So that was a complicated answer to a simple question, but I think my girls are are different because of their family of origin um, situation. So they know a lot about, they know a lot about alcohol and the deleterious impact it can have on a family. Um, And historically they didn't associate me with that but I associated me with that, you know, as I, you know, thought about how I was using alcohol. Yeah. Do you think that your children's father's drinking habits influenced your children's drinking habits significantly, partially, somewhat? Like if you were to try to, um, you know, see where, your children were the most influenced? Would it be from mama? Would it be from dad? Would it be from society and friends, college? Like, where do you think, if you had to place it in order of of influence, where do you think? Yeah, so I think for my kids, you know, their dad's relationship with alcohol was paramount. You know, so my middle daughter, who's, you know, um, we'll just say it, she's in a therapeutic boarding school right now. She's terrified of alcohol, literally terrified. How now, old is she, Raina? She's 16 and a half. And as I mentioned, you know, marijuana is her substance of choice. Um, and as we know, you know, marijuana isn't chemically addictive, but it certainly is behaviorally addictive um, as she's demonstrated. But, you know, she doesn't drink, James, because of her dad's history. And my oldest daughter, um, is really judicious about drinking. And I know she never drinks and drives. And, you know, she's usually the, like case in point, Saturday night, they had the fall formal. My kid was home at 1030, you know, sober as a judge. And her friend who was staying with us came home three hours later um, with a designated driver and had been drinking. But like, so she's making good choices because we talk about it a lot. So I think, you know, in the hierarchy, I think, you know, family of, and then, her, her dad, um, certainly watching me. Um, but I think they didn't think I had a problem. I mean, I honestly believe that because I've had separate conversations with both of them. So I'm, I'm imputing the problem on myself. Um, and certainly society, you know, glamorizes alcohol. I mean, we talk about that a lot of the program that's smiling assassins and, you know, attractively packaged poison. I mean, it's, it's ubiquitous and it's, and it's, marketed to everyone, including young people, young adults. Mm. 
How much responsibility do you personally feel towards helping your children navigate alcohol and the ramifications of drinking alcohol? I mean, they're at an age now where they're out, they're adults or about to be, you know, I guess considered legally adults, so that they're free to make their own choices. Right. How much responsibility have you taken upon yourself to ensure that they have a healthy relationship with alcohol? Oh, a tremendous amount of responsibility. I think that, um, and now having gone through this program, James, and, and formed, you know, lifetime friendships through it, um, I think I'm in a better position to help have those conversations um, and, you know, tell anecdotal stories and reveal my own stories. And, um, you know, and, and, and the great news is, you know, their dad is willing to have those conversations with them as well, which is just so cool, you know, and, and, and his experience to it, like he, he's has no alcohol in his life because he can't do it in moderation. Um, and I'm electing to do that as well. Um, I don't know. I think we have a tremendous responsibility um, to our children on, on forming the relationship of alcohol. Do you feel like you have a, a more informed, better informed uh, view of alcohol now, which uh, having gone through the last 90 or so days um, inside of our Project 90 experience and forming those friendships that you were talking about, do you think you're in a better, stronger position now to be able to influence your children's behavior, not, not least your own? Oh, absolutely. You know, for, you know, first there's the science of it with, you know, as, as you know, our coaches have gone through a similar experience themselves. So they have firsthand knowledge of, of the journey, but, you know, and the, and the science behind why, you know, why we drink, you know, what needs that serves and what it actually does to our brains and our bodies. But then there's a whole other level of the insights that we make individually and collectively, and that are, you know, catalyzed by one another of, you know, how, I'll just say it, sinister and, and toxic alcohol has been in our lives. And people share their darkest moments with alcohol. And, you know, it's a real, it's a real wake up call. You know, it's, it's very illuminating. You know, and I even revealed um, on a, in a breakout in one of the last days with one of uh, the people in my cohort that graduated on the same day I did, that one of the biggest um, revelations I had during the 90 days was the impact alcohol had on my relationships. You know, I've been, I've been married three times, James, and um, it's something that it wears very heavily on me. Uh, weighs very heavily on me, you know, um, but I've, I've looked back at the role alcohol has played in the demise of those relationships. And, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a causal impact. Um, and is that from your own consumption of alcohol only, or is it from you and your ex-husband's consumption as well? Yeah. So, in two of the relationships, it was both of us. And in one of the relationships, it was just me, you know, with the girl's father who was um, abstaining at that time um, and said it was totally fine that I would drink and that he didn't, but turned out he really resented it. Um, huh. Really, really resented that I could, you know, drink and, you know, at the time in moderation and be very successful in my career and, um, and raise our daughters but that he had to abstain. Um, but it, it was, it was like a schism that just got bigger and bigger until it was a gulf that we couldn't, you know, navigate. Mm. Did he share, um, how long he had felt that resentment? Was he aware of that resentment or was it an unconscious feeling that he only became conscious about later? I think the latter, mm. I think the latter. Yeah. So interesting, isn't it? It's um, a lot of it is communication challenges between people, not just partners, but just human beings in general. And then only with the benefit of hindsight, can we kind of, you know, 
perform the post-mortem, so to speak, and really figure out what went wrong or what was causing uh, resentment or what was ca causing discomfort. Were you able to look back during these 90 so days and, and kind of do post-mortem, so to speak, on some of those, those relationships? Yeah, yeah, I, I did. Um, you know, and, and your point about communication is just spot on, James. When you're numb, you know, you're not picking up on everything. You're not recognizing your partner's needs. You're not asking what your partner needs, right? You're just being numb, right? And detached and kind of in your own world. So, I mean, successful relationships are about, you know, getting your needs met and being able to articulate what they are and, and hopefully having a partner that is, wants to, is happy to help meet those needs, right? Or navigate what works. But when you're numb, you know, you're not even in a position to have those kinds of conversations and, and you misperceive one another quite a bit, right? You know, um, yeah. So yeah, that was, that was um, I'll tell you that came, it was the last, of course, the things that we're, we feel the worst about are the hardest to shine a light on, right? Um, and for me, that was kind of the end of my, my tour of duty. I kind of realized, wow, you know, I, I don't, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't think, I think my, my first marriage would have been totally fine if I knew then what I know now. I, I'm certain of it. If I knew then what I know now, we would still be married happily. Mm. So that's that. a powerful realization, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the beautiful thing is, at least the way I experience it, is that you have tremendous self awareness, at least now. Maybe if you felt like you didn't have that self awareness back then, you appear, certainly to me, to be having increasing amounts of self-awareness now. Does it feel that way for you? Oh yeah. And so, and I'm, and I'm dating now, James, like I'm, I'm seeking my sacred partner at age 55. <laughs> um, and I took three years off from dating. Um, and I started, you know, last fall. Um, but it's been really interesting going on first dates without alcohol. I mean, I challenge anyone who's listening to this to remember the last time they went on a first date without having a drink in their hands, you know, the social lubricant or, you know, um, helping with inhibitions to have that, those first conversations, but it's been, it's been remarkable and, and how I message why I'm doing it. You know, I'm kind of being really vulnerable. And I, I tell um, people that I'm meeting that, you know, my daughter's, um, you know, navigating her own challenges with substances right now. So I wanted to do this in solidarity with her. And, and like, so that, that's a whole, and that's, that's a lot to handle, like at the beginning of a story, right? But if somebody can't have those discussions or, or um, be amenable to um, me being on that journey with my kid in that, in this moment, then they're not for me. Uh, so it's been, it's been really interesting. May I ask um, what has been the different responses from those that you've gone on a first date with when you've shared what you've shared? When they, first of all, when they become aware that you, you won't be drinking on this right. first date. And then secondly, when you share what, a little bit about what's been going on with your, with your family. Yeah. So I would say on, um, on the one side of the spectrum, there's the when's the 90th day and you know let's go to wine country on the 91st day kind of oh, response yeah. mm -hmm. and then on the other is um like just very genuine you know um empathy you know because when you when you when you tell stories about addiction to any substance james people have addiction in their in their nexus right? It just, they've got somebody that's one degree of separation. 
that's had an experience, right? So when you when you open yourself up and you share that experience, you know, a compassionate person or a kind person is going to share their experience. So it's on the other side of the spectrum, it's a it's a connecting point. Like, wow, good on you. That's amazing. You're an amazing mother. That's a that's phenomenal that you're doing that. That kind of reaction. So they get second dates. <laughs> 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 what's the out of interest what's the percentage of those who are the former which is oh wednesday 91 when when when's this over and what percentage is the, the they're open and receptive and in, encouraging of you yeah i would say it's 50 50 you know and, wow. I, and, I'll, and i'll share another thing james like um i have a childhood friend that um had that friendship is at least on ice right now, um, and in large part because of this program. Um, um, Cause she was one of these, oh, well, I'll plan that party, you know, when you're drinking again, was kind of the first um, reaction. And then um, we, we went out to dinner with um, the guy that she was seeing and they both were drinking and I was not drinking and she totally misperceived an interaction and, um, and, you know, went on offense kind of, you know, attacking me about it. And like, James, she couldn't have been more wrong. And I was, you know, very clear about what I said and what my intentions were. Um, but yeah, so that, that friendship is um, alienated right now because of alcohol. So maybe we should change the uh, tagline from, you know, project 90, helping people create joy to breaking up friendships. <laughs> no, no, it's not. You know what it is though? So, so the, like, I want to get back to the friendship point with project 90 um, yeah. that, um, you know, we've got Gen Z, millennials, Gen X and baby boomers in the group when I was there, which is pretty extraordinary you know, um, age gaps. Um, yet the common experiences and the, the love, I'll just say it, the love that people are willing to share with one another and support is truly outstanding. I mean, it was, it was surprising and a beautiful thing. Um, so I've made some very close friends that I know will be lifetime friends in the group. I'm so happy that that was your experience. I, uh, I, I want to return to something you shared there about the, you know, the different responses you're getting from men on these dates and, and from your friends, from this particular friend. Um, in my view, and I don't want this to be um, too critical of people, but it's, it seems to me that that reaction of, oh, when's your day 90? Oh, finally, then we can go and have some fun. Then we can go to the wine country. Oh, I'll plan a big party for you when you hit to 90 days. In my view, that's very lazy and outdated thinking. That's just I how, I, how yeah. I experience that. Um, and as I keep sharing with people who are, who always are entertaining the idea of joining us in Project 90, this is not about getting to 90 days alcohol free and then celebrating with a drink. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It completely defeats the purpose. Right. The idea is to get long-term power over your drinking habits. It's to change your relationship to or with alcohol. And so the very notion that you would do a, let's call it a little challenge. A lot of people, you know, mistakenly call, think that the project 90 program is a fun little challenge and that at the end of that challenge they'll get to like ah, oh, all right now let's open up the champagne and the wine and return to the very habits that had you not particularly happy not feeling joy feeling numb that brought you here in the first place so uh i i, I guess i'm just saying that because i, I want to I guess the word is sympathize or empathize with you that you are receiving that kind of response. And at the same time, I think now that you are this version of you and your way of being is now creating joy 
and experiencing joy, I think you're going to find that you're going to start attracting a heck of a lot more people who are going to be so encouraging of you and your beliefs and your actions. And also people of a, of a similar mindset and a similar way of being. I can just speak from my own experience. When I quit alcohol way back in 2010, I didn't intentionally cut certain friends. I just naturally gravitated towards a different set of friends. Right. I just naturally started to attract what I perceived and what I felt to be a higher caliber or a higher energetic type of friend. Or even if you remove the word higher, just a, a similar type of energy. You know, because I'm not, I'm not saying that being alcohol free makes you a better person or and drinking makes you, you know, not as good a person. I'm not saying that, but when I quit alcohol, I just naturally attracted people who are on a similar energetic frequency to me. And so I think if your, if your statistics now on these first dates are 50, 50, which is men saying, oh, let's wait till you get to 90 and then we'll drink. I think you're going to find that it'll increasingly be moving towards like 75% of men are going to be very encouraging and uh, enthusiastic about this incredible confident woman who is owning the fact that she's loving being alcohol free and that her, that she doesn't require this attractively packaged poison in order to enjoy a date or in order to go traveling to Napa, you know, to wine country, etc. So I don't know. That was my little rant. No, and I, I agree with you. And, and I believe, you know, that where you put your attention becomes your intention and the law of attraction. I believe it. So I'm exuding that now and we'll see, we'll check in in a few months and see if your theory is correct. <laughs> yeah. I want to know what the statistics are. I want to see what the percentage split is. <laughs> you know, the other well, thing that it's worth mentioning, James, in light of the fact that you said that, you know, when you started your journey, you didn't know if it was going to, where it was going to take you. I mean, I honestly thought I was one of those people that took this on as a challenge. You know, um, I had gotten to the point where I was drinking every day, you know, during COVID, as, you know, many of the people in my circle did, um, um, you know, happy hour started at five kind of thing. Um, and I thought, you know, I want to see if I can do this for 90 days. And then, and I would say that, you know, I'm an edophile, you know, I grew up with wine and, and my, I don't know, I, I love wine anyway, as the, as you know, time passed and I kept feeling better and better and I looked better and better. Um, like it just, it didn't have any appeal to me at all. Like I thought it was going to be a lot harder than it actually was because it builds on itself, right? And where I am now is, you know, I, I have no desire to drink right now, which surprises me. It's the holidays, you know, every single function I'm going to, you know, the alcohol is flowing freely and not just any alcohol. I mean, we're in San Francisco, for God's sakes. It's the, the best, you know, wine, the best wines in the world are here for us. And, um, but I just it just doesn't have any appeal. It doesn't have any power of me. It's pretty, I'm surprised, honestly. Um, and, and that's been a very, um, welcome outcome of participating in the program. And it seems like it's opened the door for you to access the joy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, Raina, I want to just acknowledge you and thank you for opening up and being vulnerable and sharing what some may consider to be, you know, very personal things about your family life and about your, I guess, romantic life in terms of ex-husbands and being and dating as well. I think it shows a tremendous amount of courage um, for you to share so openly about that. And I'm sure that our listener really appreciates it as well. So assuming that our listener is of the same mindset as me on behalf of him and her, I want to say thank you so much for being so open on during our conversation. Yeah, that's my pleasure. Uh, as Brene Brown would say, I believe that our vulnerability is our strength. I believe that. Yes. Well said. 
Well, Raina, thank you so much again. Congratulations again. And I look forward to watching your continued journey as you venture down this alcohol-free lifestyle. Yeah, well, thank you, James, for ideating this program and for attracting such phenomenal coaches and people to create an ethos that enabled this to happen. So I'm deeply grateful to you. So thank you. You're so welcome.